Thank you all for uh, coming tonight and for the opportunity to talk to you. And I'm going to try and give you a taste of what I do. And I was asked to talk both about content of my research, but also reflect a little bit on how I got to where I am and skills that are required for this kind of career, and to talk about how some of what I'm covering science-wise might connect to things you do in the classroom. So I'm going to try and pull some aside as I go. And in the process of talking about research, I'm going to try and touch on actually a couple of little vignettes. I'm not going to tell you one long story. I'm going to tell you three shorter stories. Uh, hopefully I don't run over time. And um, by way of introduction to this, I want to start by letting you reflect momentarily on the, the mental image that your students have when they hear about a scientist. And it's very much the white lab coat, glove, goggles, etc. And why is that? Some of that's media. Some of that's because of what they do in science classrooms. They've got to wear their lab coats and their goggles and their gloves for safety purposes, and that's good. Safety's good. Um, we practicing scientists are actually horribly lax about things like safety. Um, yeah, really. Um, and so the kind of classic image of students in lab coats or people wearing gloves and usually big fancy machinery comes to mind too. If it's more expensive, it's more scientific, of course. Um, and this is part of what we do. Every one of these photos is somebody working in my lab. But there's much more to what I do as a scientist. And I want to try and turn things around and talk about the other side of science. Because a lot of fields in science, whether it be environmental chemistry or biology, geology, even physics, certainly astronomy, has to look outward, outside of that lab, to places like this, which is where I spend my summers as often as I can. This is a lake on Vancouver Island in western British Columbia, Canada. And we have a little experiment going on. You see these little uh, objects here along the side of the lake, and there's another mine of them over there. That's one of our experiments from a couple of years ago. And I'll touch on the content of this experiment as I go. But this is my laboratory. And I have a second laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin, which is really secondary in the sense that I go here first, and I get information. And then I do some of the detail work back in Austin at my leisure. So a closer look at uh, those cages. This is a top-down view of a series of experiments looking at um, behavioral changes and neuro neurobiological regulation of color signals that males adopt to communicate with other individuals or to hide from other individuals. And uh, there's a snorkeler there. You can see these ripples, maybe, if you're close enough behind that snorkeler. Let's zoom in on that snorkeler. Uh, that's actually uh, Kim Hendricks, who's a teacher um, in Texas, a high school science teacher. Uh, we've had quite a few high school and middle school science teachers from AISD and Round Rock and elsewhere join us up in Canada uh, for substantial periods of time for research. So what is it that we do exactly? Um, well, I'm a professor of integrative biology. And I want to highlight that term, integrative biology, and talk briefly about what that is, and then I'll give you some examples. Integrative biology is a fudge word, in the sense that when the zoology and botany departments combined 15 years ago, politically it was considered maybe not expedient to call it evolution and ecology, which is really what most of the people in the program study. And so instead it was integrative biology to try and go under some political radars in Texas. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about that more later if you wish. But um, what does that actually mean? I'd say that what it means in practice is it's a collection of people who don't work on single molecules or single cells, but who take a whole organism, whole population, or even a whole community perspective on biology. And so for myself, my concept map for what I do is a combination of ecology, which is how I got into the sciences. I just like being outside. I want to know how species interact with each other, so I thought, I want to become an ecologist. And then I realized how fascinating evolution is, so I added that to my um, curriculum over time. And then in graduate school, I spent a lot of time working on things like biomechanics and morphology, thinking about anatomy and the evolution of body shape and the physics of how those bodies work. Once I started as a professor, I added more work in immunology. Actually, the majority of my lab now are immunologists, and we study evolution of the vertebrate immune system. 
And then lastly, anything evolutionary involves genetic change, and so we need to bring in genetics and now genomics to study the mechanisms of that evolution at the level of genomes. Now, if you're going to do genomics or immunology or evolution or ecology, you need a healthy dose of mathematics, particularly statistics. And so I teach statistics. I actually don't teach any biology classes at all. I teach statistics <laughs> because that's what I actually do most of the time. Um, and to do statistics, you need computer programming because I often write my own computer code to do my own analyses. So we'll get back more to that uh, skill set list at the very end. So I want to give you an example of where these things intersect. Namely, I'm interested in, it's a little faint here, in adaptation. How is it that organisms evolve to fit their environment and that fit requires changes in their traits, which are underlined by, underlined by genes and are driven by the environment. Competition, predation, parasitism, temperature, and so forth. And so, if I want to understand how organisms evolve to adapt to their environment, I need to bring all of these things together. I need to integrate these many perspectives and skill sets, hence the term integrative biology. So I'm going to give you a couple of vignette examples of this. Starting with, I'm going to go just through three questions. And the first question is what really formed a lot of the core of my research, is the question of why does among individual variation persist in populations? We can look at a school of fish and say, gee, they're fish, they all look the same to me. But every single one of the individuals here is genetically unique, they're morphologically unique, their physiology is different from each other, and that variation matters in fundamental ways. And that actually poses a huge puzzle. In fact, one of the grand challenges in evolutionary biology is explaining why we're not all clones. And let me explain why that is. So a, a fundamental notion in evolutionary biology is the idea of a fitness landscape. It's a landscape in the sense that we have a function, um, a curve relating fitness that's either survival probability or fecundity. Fecundity is, of course, what matters the most. If you don't survive, if you survive, but you don't have any offspring, you don't pass on your genes. So it's really all about reproduction, but you have to survive up to that point, of course. And so we have some composite measure of how many offspring an individual leaves behind as a function of some trait they have, some phenotype, how big they are, the shape of their jaw, the amount of immunoglobin that they produce, the amount of antibodies. And we can measure empirically a function that relates their fitness to this trait. In evolution over time, there's a huge body of mathematics that shows, as well as empirical work shows, that we're going to drive a phenotype up to the maximum fitness. Okay, so imagine we have a population shown by this histogram here, and the average trait value is over here, shown by that dot. So there's this population sitting on a slope of this fitness landscape. And the field of quantitative genetics, dating back to the 1930s, says that the slope of that function dictates the speed and direction at which the average trait of the population will change. Okay, if it's flat, it won't change. If it's sloped, it'll change in the direction of increasing fitness. That's called directional selection. And so here the population is going to move over time up to the point where it's at a peak. Now, those of you who teach calculus know how you find those peaks, right? You take a first derivative, and then you check whether it's maximum by doing your second derivative. I do that on a regular basis using actual data on fitness of wild animals. I calculate those first and second derivatives of empirical functions to find where that fitness maximum is. Now, once it's there, it's no longer directional selection because there's no slope. We have a slope of zero. So what's the second derivative? If the second derivative of this function is negative, then we're dealing with a situation of stabilizing selection, which tends to purge variation because the individuals over here and over here aren't actually doing as well as the individuals at the middle. So they're tossed out over time. They don't reproduce as well. So over time, selection winnows out the variation in the population. If you let it go long enough, you will end up with a bunch of clones. So why are we not all clones of each other? Because clearly, variability is not simply a feature of humans, but these are all one species. These are all one species. These are not only the same species, but they were found growing within three inches of each other. Um, these two fish are the same species, and they're found about 100 meters apart, um, and they're typical of their respective populations. These sea stars are all found all together. They're all the same species. Why does that variation persist? 
Well, there are a bunch of reasons, and I'm just going to tell you about one, but this has been the mainstay of my own research, is answering this question. And I'm going to talk to you today about color variation. These are male three-spined stickleback. It's a fish that's common in British Columbia, which is why I go up there. It's abundant. They're easy to rear in the laboratory. We can do all sorts of experiments with them. Just a, a nice guinea pig organism, basically, that can span laboratory to field settings. And as you can see here, um, there's a wide range of color variation. These are all males, and they go from really dark black to iridescent blue to really bright red, although it's hard to see on this projector, to just really dull and indistinguishable from females. And depending on the lake that we go to, we see these different phenotypes. But even within a single location, we see some of this variability. Why is that? Now, a quick aside, stickleback are actually famous within the biology community for a variety of reasons, one of which is this nice red throat and blue eyes. And there's a, one of the founders of the field of animal behavior, oh, actually, wait, quick aside here. Another reason why stickleback are famous today, how many of you know of HHMI's biointeractive website? This is an amazing resource for educators, and in HHMI Biointeractive, you will find the stickleback evolution virtual lab. So what I'm talking about today is not in this, but there are many other researchers. There's a huge community of stickleback researchers. There are like 70 labs around the world in 24 countries studying this one organism. And some of that work is featured in this virtual lab that's highly interactive, so you can go there if you want to know more about this particular organism. So, Nicholas Tinbergen, one of the founders of the field of behavior, recipient of a Nobel Prize in 1973, is famous for coining ideas of conditioned behavior and supernormal stimulus. The supernormal stimulus is an idea he got from working with stickleback. He took female stickleback, and he noticed that they got really excited when the red postal truck drove by. <laughs> um, and so he started presenting them with male models that weren't red, and with various shaped things that don't really look that much like a male stickleback, but had red chins. And the females really got excited by anything that was red. All right? Um, and so it's this ingrained innate preference for red things that seems to not be taught or learned by experience. Um, so it's an innate behavior, and they really respond strongly to something big that's very red. So in my lab, we don't wear red clothes into the fish room because the fish freak out. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, give you a quick... Uh, so we're going to see a, a nice red male in a moment here. He's going to pop up from his nest. There he goes. Here comes a female. She's gravid, classic head-up posture. And she's not actually all that interested, is she? And he's like, wait, wait, what happened? So quick visit. That female leaves, she's gravid, he's red, nothing happens. There's more to this story than just having a red chin. And that's partly why we've gotten interested in this system, because there is all of this variation. Conrad Lorenz says, stickleback love red things, and yet we have populations where nobody's red. We have populations where some individuals are red and some aren't. Why does that variation persist? So we started working on nest... Uh, nest habitat as an explanation. So there's a male stickleback, there's his nest, the male's nest, the females come and drop eggs, they take off, and they never visit again, and the male does all of the parental care. There's a great Eric Carle book, Mr. Seahorse, that features a stickleback. Doing, it's all about male parental care in a fish, the whole children's book. Um, so this is a map of a lake. Every dot is a nest that we sampled a couple years ago. The bigger dots are deeper nests, the shallower dots are smaller, our shallower nests. So we see a wide range of variation in nest size. By wide range, I mean some males are nesting in a half meter, some are two meters deep. It's actually not that big. I mean, that's like my feet to a little over my head, right? Um, and yet that matters for the environment that they live in. The downwelling light and also the sidewelling light spectrum that these males are seen against by an approaching female varies with depth. If any of you scuba dive, you know if you go deep, there's no red light. Yeah, you can't see red because those wavelengths don't penetrate through the water very far. And so a red male shallow is visible because there's red light to reflect, and his background is blue, so he's visible. If he was deeper, he wouldn't be visible. 
but a blue male would be. So we might expect that nest depth determines male's color. And sure enough, when we measure male color on our y-axis as a function of depth of their nest on the x-axis, we see a significant correlation that's repeatable across many years. We see it in many different populations. And in the few lakes where this depth gradient is reversed, and it's red over here, it's blue over here, the male gradient flips. So males are always a different color than the background light against which they are being seen. So we think, great, they must be trying to stand out and be, be seen. Of course, there are trade-offs there, because if you're seen, you also might get eaten, because there are trout and there are loons and things like that that love to eat stickleback. One other reason why you might not want to be seen is males beat the heck out of each other. We can't keep two of them in the same tank. So over here, we have natural males. Here we have 3D printed models. Cost $2 a pop. If you want to go print yourself some stickleback, I have the shape file. You're welcome to print some. <laughs> um, I had an art student at UT paint them to look approximately like redder and bluer male stickleback. And then we put a GoPro camera in front of a nesting male, and we dangled one of these mannequins in front of this male, and we basically asked, what do these males do with intruders, and do they care about the color of the intruder? So here's a quick video showing that yes, they do care. This is actually one of the less uh, violent versions, but this male's going to come up, take a look, and bite, and bite again. <laughs> And this male keeps biting that model for half an hour. It's not going to go away. If we dangle an un a different object that doesn't look like a stickleback, they don't pay any attention to it. Now, remember, this is a bluish model. We also put red models in. Now, we have two lakes that we did this in. And this is work done by Kim Hendricks, a uh, teacher within Texas, a high school teacher. And there's one lake where the males are all red, and there's a lake where the males are all blue, give or take a bit. And in the red lake, the red models got beaten up a lot more. In the blue lake, the blue models got beaten up a lot more. So they're conditioned to see whatever they're used to encountering, and they ignore the other phenotype. So that creates an advantage to being rare. If you are atypical, you kind of go under the radar just fine. Turns out that's not just true for male-male competition. It's true for competition for food. If you eat something a little unusual, you have it to yourself. If you have an unusual immune phenotype, the local parasites don't notice you. If you have an unusual color, the local predators don't notice you. So the punchline here is that we see adaptation to remarkably fine environmental scales. Literally a stickleback nesting at the, if my top of my head is the water surface, a stickleback nesting at shoulder depth is different morphologically than a stickleback nesting by my ankles. That's really fine scale environmental variation. They care, they adapt to it. Some of that adaptation, it turns out, is genetic. Some of that is induced by the environment. They can tell the environment that they're in, and they adjust their color accordingly. And that's the context of those cage experiments that I showed you earlier, where we force males to be shallow or deep, and they change their color accordingly. So just a quick aside in terms of your particular classrooms, you can do this kind of thing at home. Okay, If you have a a 3D scanner, or you know someone who does, or there's an uh, engineering lab nearby that can do this, you can take local fish, there's sunfish all over the place here in Texas, you can scan it, get a shape file, print them, paint them, GoPro cameras cost about $100 a pop, they come with a waterproof housing, you put them in, and you and your students can record interactions between fish and mannequins, and fish are stupid enough to care about the mannequins. They can't tell the difference very well. So, it's an experiment that's easy to do, and actually all of the videos that we took, we took about 90 hours of video of nesting males interacting with these mannequin intruders, and the data was all scored by high school students in Texas. Mm -hmm. I want to move on to another question now. I told you one adaptive story, now I'm going to tell you another. And this is based on a classic uh, comment by Stephen Jay Gould one of the, really, the great thinkers in evolutionary biology, although he was wrong about many things we now know. But he said, if you wind back the tape of life to the early days, and you hit play again, and you allow evolution to play out a second time, would you get the same outcome? 
Or would you get something fundamentally different? Is evolution repeatable? Is it predictable? Does it follow a deterministic course? Or is it really variable <laughs> and stochastic and unpredictable? So, stickleback, in a sense, allow us to replay that tape of life. That's why it's on HHMI's BioInteractive. That's why hundreds of people study it. Vancouver Island was covered by ice 12,000 years ago. It was under a mile of ice. There were no lakes. There were no streams. There were stickleback in the ocean nearby. We have their fossils. When the ice melted, stickleback in the ocean, where most stickleback live, colonized up rivers to establish permanent lake and stream populations. And in those lake and stream populations, they evolved differences from the marine form. They lost armor. And you can learn all about that in HHMI that's biointeractive. And, but not all freshwater sites are the same. There are big lakes and small lakes and fast rivers and slow rivers. And they evolve unique adaptations to their respective freshwater habitats as well. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the key, if I back up a sec, is this independent origin. This is a replicated experiment. There are thousands of watersheds from Oregon up to Alaska over to Japan that independently were colonized by stickleback. The same starting population of marine fish independently and in high replication invaded freshwater and evolved locally. So it's an experiment that's been running for 13,000 years, 12,000 years. I couldn't have designed it if I tried. Now, one of the habitat contrasts that we work in are lakes and streams that exist in very close proximity. Fish are able to move back and forth between them and occasionally do. Uh, that's the subject of a whole other talk. And they exhibit dramatically different morphologies and adaptations. This is a typical lake fish from that site. This is a typical stream fish from this site. And I've snorkeled from that lake all the way down the stream without having to go over any physical barrier. It, this is about 150 meters right there. So it's a very short distance. How did that adaptive divergence take place? Well, here's an example. There's a lake, a stream going out of it. This is just a measure of morphology as a function of distance downstream. There's a typical lake morphology. And as you sample at various distances downstream, they initially in the stream look quite lake-like because they're receiving a lot of immigrants from the lake that introduce lake genes into that stream site. And as you go further and further downstream, that input of genes from the lake gets less and less effective, and they end up asymptotically approaching a very typical stream form. And we can also look at genetic data. This is based on about 200,000 single nucleotide <coughs> variants in the genome. Um, every dot's an animal. And then we're basically doing ancestry testing. It's like Ancestry.com, but for stickleback. And the black dots are a typical, these are fish from the lake. The red dots are fish that we caught in the stream. But some of the fish that we caught in the stream, they sure look like they have lake ancestry. Others definitely don't have lake ancestry. Those are absolutely, unambiguously stream fish. And so we can score fish genetically by how lake or stream lake, and we can conclude very clearly that there's genome-wide divergence at lots of loci between these adjacent populations. Now, every letter, I realize these are small for you, but every letter here is a separate lake stream pair that we've studied in replicate. They're in different watersheds, so each was independently colonized from ocean fish and has been evolving separately as replicates for 12,000 years. So we have a bunch of replicates, and now I can use this to say how repeatable is this evolution. It's as if, instead of winding back the tape of life and replaying it, I just have 16 tapes of life playing simultaneously. And I ask, do they lead to the same thing or not? So... We can use statistics to measure for every morphological trait that we study, and this is scatter plot is every single morphological trait. We have about 160 characters here. We can ask, to what extent are they evolving in the same way every time? To what extent are they evolving differently in one watershed versus another? Or at the origin, to what extent are they really not adapting to habitat ever at all? Okay. So to give you an example, point A here is a phenotype, and the stream fish are always lower value for this morphological trait than the lake fish are. <coughs> this point over here, which is kind of a mix, 
almost always the stream fish have a higher value, deeper bodies, but there are three in, in black, there are three exceptions to the rule. So mostly repeatable, but not completely repeatable. Then we have a site over here where half of the time, this is a, a biomechanical measure of jaw opening force, half of the time the stream fish create more force than lake fish, half of the time it's the other way around. Absolutely not repeatable. And then there are cases over here where there are differences between watersheds, but never is the stream different from the lake. Now, that's one morphology at a time. We can also take a highly multivariate view of the parallelism of evolution. And we're going to use some trigonometry and linear algebra to do this. So we can take two different traits, or we can actually extrapolate this to many, many traits. And let's say each dot is a fish from a lake and the corresponding stream. I can calculate the average for trait 1 for this lake and the average for trait 2. So there's the average for trait 1 and 2. There's the average for trait 1 and 2 in that stream. And I'm going to make that a vector from the multivariate average of one to the multivariate average of the other. Now we have vectors. I ignored vectors in high school. I didn't care about matrix algebra at all because nobody told me I could use it to study biology. Here we have a separate watershed, again a vector from the lake to the stream. Now, let's just push those lakes together, and we can ask, what's the angle between these in multivariate space? If there's an angle, it means that they are not perfectly repeatable, not perfectly parallel. So parallel evolution is this commonly invoked idea a way of saying that we have repeatability in the outcome of evolution, there's a literal mathematical definition of that parallelism that's derived from vector algebra. Okay? And so, for example, we can calculate the angle between those. We can do dot products to measure the amount of shared directionality between any pair. And so we can ask, how commonly do we see parallel evolution or not? And the answer in multivariate morphology space is, Sometimes it's parallel and sometimes it's not. So, for example, this watershed and that watershed are almost perfectly parallel. And this one and that one and that one and that one are all very parallel to each other as well, but these are almost perpendicular to those. And it turns out that when we start to invoke environmental data, we can explain why they're different. So it turns out that they're not parallel because not all lakes are the same. Not all streams are the same. And when we get environmental data, we can explain these deviations from parallel evolution as well. And we see these deviations also in genetic space. The axes aren't labeled because they are scale-free units of genotype. Basically, kind of a multivariate ancestry measure. Every line connects a lake to a stream. There's another lake to a stream, another lake to a stream. Again, we have some parallel, some parallel, and some that are perpendicular to each other. That's genome-wide, but we can look across the genome. Every dot is a genetic marker in the genome of these fish. The height is how repeatable that marker is evolving. Is it always an allele more common in the stream? So there are a bunch of sites in the genome where the allele is, a particular allele is always more common in the stream at that genetic marker. So if we focus just on those, we actually see very strong evolution, evidence of parallel evolution only for some traits, only for some loci in the genome. And it turns out, guess what? Those alleles, those genes, are where we map those phenotypes to. And so we're able to pull it all together and say that environmental variation leads to some amount of parallel, repeatable evolution, and some not, depending on the traits and the genes that we look at. Last story. Let me see how I'm doing on time here. Yeah, pretty good. Um, I meant to put a trigger warning over this. Uh, this is a stickleback with some of its house guests. Those came out of that fish. I hope we're not having sushi for dinner. Um, those are tapeworms, and um, there are a lot of parasites in fish. I do still eat sushi, by the way, um, even though I study these things intensively now. So one of the questions that we ask is, how do these parasites drive evolution of the hosts? Now the fish aren't just adapting to light or to lake or stream. Now they're adapting to a co-evolving antagonist who can evolve in response to them in turn. So 
this is a more benign parasite. This is a little uh, bivalve that lives on the gills of the fish and just takes a little bit of their blood. Um, and the y-axis here is the per percentage, the proportion of fish that are infected by this. Every dot's a different population on Vancouver Island. We have some populations where 99% of the fish are infected. We have other populations right nearby, a few kilometers away, where it's completely absent. Why? What's the difference? And are the fish that are up here evolving to resist the parasite? Maybe the fish down here that don't get it at all, maybe they already <coughs> evolved resistance to that parasite, and that's why we don't see it. So that's a lot of what we're studying these days, is that variation in resistance, what's the immunological and genetic basis of that variation. So here's a particular example. Um, this is a gingerbread uh, stickleback and parasite that my daughters and I made. Um, <laughs> yes, we have interesting holiday activities at home. Uh, one lake, Gaston Lake, always between about 50 and 75% of the fish are infected by that tapeworm. Roberts Lake, which is 10 kilometers away, I haven't seen that parasite in a decade, with a little caveat that I'll get to in a minute. Why are they different? Oh, there we go. There's the trigger warning version. Um, now, if we experimentally take fish, breed them, bring them into the lab, raise them for a couple of generations, now there's no difference between them except their genes. Okay? And we experimentally expose these fish to this tapeworm. This is one of the only experimental systems that we know about as biologists, where I can do genetic controlled breeding of the tapeworm and the host, and do genetic mapping on both of these concurrently. We put these tapeworms into these fish, they grow well. We put the tapeworms into these fish, they grow poorly. These little dots there, those are 42-day-old tapeworms that are full siblings of these 42-day-old tapeworms. Same age, they're brothers and sisters. Okay, the difference is the host genotype. So we have Gosling Lake Fish Raising Lab, Roberts Lake Fish Raising Labs. These are F2 hybrids. These are back cross hybrids if you know your Mendelian genetics. This is classic additive inheritance, quantitative trait. The growth rate of these worms is not a worm trait. It's a host trait. Host genes control that worm behavior. How? Well, we're working now on doing immunology, the cell biology and the biochemistry, to trace the detailed mechanisms of that control. It includes cell biology, it includes genomics, it includes gene expression and transcriptomics, and putting all of these together, as well as histology. One of the cool things about this system is tapeworms. This is a histological section here of a fish spleen. Those little blobs there are macrophages that are bringing um, antigen to B cells, to teach B cells what to attack and what to make antibodies for. In humans, this happens in the thymus. In fish, it's the spleen. It's called the B cell germinal center. This is where your B cells get woken up and taught to make antibodies. Okay? And when we inject fish with, vac with a vaccine, these centers, these little blobs, get a lot bigger. Classic uh, B cell response. They're gone. This slide here is from a fish that was infected by the tapeworm. The tapeworm demolishes those B cell germinal centers. Okay? And the extent to which that happens depends strongly on the genotype of the cestodes. So the y-axis here is the size of those centers. If they're infected, they're way up. If they're not infected, they're way up here. Infection drives them down. Three different cestode populations, two different host populations. The extent to which the cestode is suppressing host immunity depends on the genotype of the worms and on the gene type of the host in combination. So this is a co-evolving system where the parasites are trying to subvert and, uh, and destroy the host immune response, and the host are trying to counteract that. So we can determine how vertebrates suppress tapeworm growth. We can learn how tapeworms suppress host immunity. Our hope is that if we learn how immunosuppression works, we can find new immunosuppressive drugs. If we find how hosts slow down parasite growth, we can find new drugs. Okay? Also, understanding the maintenance of variation in these traits can be crucial for agriculture, for medicine, personalized genetics and personalized medicine, as well as conservation biology. That is why I say I do this when I talk to grant agencies, funding groups like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, 
Why I really do this is I get to go to awe-inspiring places. <laughs> I get to study things that really puzzle me. Why is there so much variation in life on Earth, not just among species, but within species? Something we can all relate to as humans. Why is there so much variation in the form and function? And it being just before dinner, I'm going to spare you the videos of fish eating other fish. <laughs> so, real briefly to wind up, I want to comment on the skills and knowledge base that are needed to get to do this kind of task. First and foremost, and unfortunately this is cut off a little bit. Let me see if I can adjust this up a little bit because my... Not really. Okay, I'll just say it. Number one, it's a love and fascination with the natural world. Okay, this is my daughter. She did a summer camp at the Audubon Sanctuary in Cape Cod last summer. And after each day, she would give my wife and I and our younger daughter a tour of the sanctuary in her best teacher voice. <laughs> okay, get kids outside and they will learn to love being outside. They'll learn to be curious and you can really cultivate that. There's no high-tech equipment involved, just getting outside. Second is the polar opposite, math, 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 math. You cannot do biology without math. And I have to say, I was badly served as a student through middle school and high school and even through a lot of college and thinking that biology was the math-free option in the sciences. It is far, far, far from it. So what can you do about it? If you're teaching a math class, bring in some biology. If you're teaching a biology class, show how the math applies. I do calculus, I do linear algebra, I do matrix algebra on a very regular basis. Uh, statistics, of course, is absolutely fundamental. Um, and more and more, biology is driving statistics. That's not a recent thing. Tests like the t-test, the analysis of variance, regression, correlation tests, stochastic theory, birth-death processes, were all developed not by mathematicians, but by, uh, but by biologists who had a concrete statistical puzzle to solve. Sir Ronald Fisher, one of the foremost statisticians, was a geneticist, primarily. Francis Galton, who invented regression, he was a biologist, a human geneticist, primarily. With statistics comes computer programming. If there's any one thing that I spend most of my time doing, it's writing computer code to do that statistics. So don't encourage, please encourage your students to learn stats and computation, but you can't, of course, skimp on the writing either. Writing is really, if I can't write well, I can't do this job. Um, and you have to learn to write in all sorts of settings, like when I'm in the field and have a grant proposal due, I need to be able to sit down and get the writing done. Very last thing, we have a lot of opportunities for teachers. Um, we have opportunities in the lab. If you work with us well enough in advance, Labs at UT that have National Science Foundation funds can ask for supplements to tack onto their grant. And professors love doing that, by the way. They love getting more money from NSF. These research experience for teachers, RETs, are supplements on top of existing grants to bring teachers into labs to do uh, summer research experiences. In the lab, or in our case in the field, Tanya Tazneem is a teacher at Keeling Middle School now. Uh, Samantha Killian is a teacher up in Round Rock. They've both worked with me up in the field and in the lab. College of Natural Sciences at UT has lots of resources, ranging from Science Under the Stars, which grad students in my graduate program began, I'm proud to say. Um, Fun with Chemistry, Astronomy Star Parties, the High School Summer Research Academy, Explore UT. There are many, many resources. You can learn more at the College of Natural Sciences website. And I've put copies of the Texas Scientist uh, magazine up on the desk over here. You are welcome to take them. If you email the person who makes these, and I'll write her name up there later, she will send your classroom free copies of these by the truckload. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time.